right here. Um, I think we still are doing fine. I think everyone looks like they're here. Um, good. Uh, a couple of announcements. Um, uh, we will be giving a midterm on Monday, March of the 13th. And both the technical side and the policy side, um, we will give you uh, five questions pick, pick three. Uh, so, um, uh, and they'll be uh, uh, up to and including material being presented at this lecture such that you can actually do the homework and get the thing back and digest um, um, what it is you learned from the point of view of the homework. And the same will pertain to uh, Professor Thomas part of the course as well. Um, second thing, on April the 3rd, we have a change of room. We'll let you know where that is, that we've still got plenty of time. We're ahead of the curve on that, so it's a little more than a month away. We're on. It's March 8th for 105. The jury was across the room. Okay. March 8th for, we'll send that message. March 8th for 105. Okay, it's um, this is it, and so they we were they uh, preempted on that, and and they they actually are going to need some large classrooms to accommodate freshmen and so forth. Okay, um, third thing uh, on our half of the course, Mr. Presti will give the lecture next week. Uh, I will get back to sit sit back and enjoy it. And this is um, the lecture you're going to hear today will be the last. So. Hang in there, policy students. This is the last of the foundational material you're going to hear. Um, thereafter, you are going to get into applications, um, which are going to be a little bit more fun. So this will complete the, 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 the foundational work that you're um, going to need. And um, Chris is going to give us uh, an overview of uh, reactors. So he's going to tell us uh, what is a light water reactor, what's a pressurized water reactor, um, what's a fast neutron reactor, why are the, why uh, do you design one particular type of reactor for another, uh, and so forth. Um, their fuel requirements, um, some of the consequences of particular types of reactors. Um, and uh, so we're going to enjoy that. Um, and uh, today we're just going to focus on two things, nuclear reactions, and specifically neutrons. Reactions is, of course, a, a very general concept. Most of what, at the 99% level, that you need to be concerned with in this class has to do with neutron-induced reactions, either fast neutrons, the MV range, or slow neutrons uh, in the thermal range. OK, let's get going. OK, as always, we do a, a quick rip through what you've done before. Uh, last time we talked about fission. This is the basic picture. Um, a uh, new, some nuclei will fission spontaneously. In most cases of interest here, we're going to look at, at uh, fission induced by uh, the absorption of a neutron, either fast or slow, um, which will give enough excitation to the nucleus that it will undergo uh, a uh, evolution in shape to what's called a scission point and then split off into two fragments, which then pick up the full kinetic energy they have of about 170 MeV uh, just by the Coulomb or the electrostatic propulsion of the two fragments. Associated with the fission process are uh, always uh, a few neutrons, statistically typically two to three, depending on the excitation energy and what type of nucleus it was. These neutrons, of course, are going to be absolutely uh, essential to understanding um, the, uh, the notion of criticality, uh, of the fact that you can get a chain reaction. That these neutrons can, in turn, strike another nucleus, cause a fission event, which causes more neutrons, which causes more fission. There's more uh, uh, energy that's released. Uh, most of the energy, sort of the, uh, the 90% level is released in the fragments, but there's a few MeV in uh, three neutrons or so. There's uh, probably another five MeV in gamma rays, and another five MeV in, in betas, and um, another five MeV in neutrinos, approximately. This is where it comes from. 
as we mentioned, I think it's an important thing, a concept to, to, to get right. Um, the fact is that the binding energy per nucleon um, in a, an actinide nucleus here is on the order of about 7.6 MeV. However, um, if you split the nucleus into two, the two fragments now are more tightly bound. And of course, that's the money maker, or where you get the, <coughs> at least the noise maker out of this thing. The fact by going to two nucleons or two separated nuclei, each with an average binding energy about an MeV more favorable, that energy shows up in the kinetic energy of the fragments and the other uh, ejecta from, from the, the fission process. There, as we just mentioned, most of the 85% of the of the energy comes out in the form of the kinetic energy of the two fragments, ultimately turning to heat, uh, 5 MeV in neutrons, um, 7 MeV from gammas, um, pump gammas, 7 MeV from gammas afterwards, and then beta particles and neutrinos from the subsequent um, beta decay, which will happen at first quickly on millisecond time scale, and then as the those Nuclei, which tend to bend to be on the neutron rich side of the value of stability, begin to ski down. Of course, as you become more and more stable, the rates for beta decay slow down. So, your last beta decay products might be in the years to hundreds to thousands of years, which, of course, is what makes the handling of nuclear waste uh, problematic, challenging. Um, we also mentioned that fission is an asymmetric process. You might say, why doesn't it break into two pieces, which are 118? Well, it does, but hardly as frequently uh, as having uh, an asymmetric fission. This is a, one of these things that comes out of a more advanced treatment of, of nuclear uh, physics and, and is unimportant to us, except just, just to know that, in fact, that's what happens. Once the primary fragments are created, as I mentioned, then of course these things begin to ski down to the value of stability by a sequence of uh, beta, the emissions of, uh, of beta decay. Here are the two things we're interested in, um, and this is where we really get into the history of nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Uh, happily, why these things are actually difficult to make um, if the fissionable, um, <clears throat> prompt fissionable. Um, components of a natural uranium in um, uh, in the crust of the Earth was the dominant component. I think uh, we would have wreaked havoc on ourselves. Uh, we, you know, every country would have been creating and using nuclear weapons long ago, and I think the consequences would have been unimaginable. Thank heavens, in uranium, it's a minority component, much less than a percent, uh, which makes it challenging, technically challenging, to to extract the the useful component uh, of uranium. Uh, with plutonium, it's created as a byproduct in the operation of nuclear reactors. You're going to hear about this from Mr. Presky next week. Um, and then you have to uh, go through the business of handling this very hot nuclear waste, doing a chemical separation, purifying it, and then, um, and then assembling it into something useful. OK, let's get on with the thing of nuclear reactions. Um, what you've heard about so far, you've talked about <laughs> nuclear decays. We're now going to talk about um, reactions. Prime example is, um, we talked about this before as the fusion reaction. Uh, fusion, of course, is uh, uh, very promising as a uh, future energy source. Um, in fact, the old joke was, um, it's the energy source of the future, always was, always will be. Um, we'll talk a little bit about why um, it's uh, hard to make work, even though when you look at the Q value, it's very favorable, 18 MeV, um, just for um, uh, the collision of five nucleons. So on the average, it's three and a half MeV per nucleon. Looks great compared to fission as a process. But in any case, this is an example of A plus B goes to C plus D. That, that's an example of a, of a nuclear reaction. So that's what we're talking about. 
if you look at various uh, nuclear reactions, you can, there's kind of a taxonomy of them in two or three categories here. Um, this is a charged particle reaction. The hydrogen uh, is uh, as one proton, whether it be singly, uh, single <coughs> hydrogen one, hydrogen two, or hydrogen three. So here you have two charged particles which have to touch, interact, and then give rise to uh, uh, the final state products. We're going to talk about that in, in just a second. Um, this is a new, this is a neutron uh, uh, reaction. Uh, we have neutrons plus carbon 12. We go to carbon 13 plus a gamma. That's called a capture gamma ray uh, reaction. Neutron capture gamma. Notice the neutron is not charged, and therefore um, you don't have to surmount any Coulomb repulsion to make that happen. It can happen even at the arbitrarily low velocity of the neutron, that reaction can go. Photons can also, um, which can be the byproduct or the secondary product of a nuclear reaction, photons themselves can, uh, uh, can induce nuclear reactions. They can photo disintegrate, they can, they, a, pho a photon can hit um, uh, uh, the, the deuteron and break it apart into a proton and a neutron like that. You have what's called elastic scattering, which is you have a proton coming in, or any, any A plus B goes to A plus B. What's the Q value for elastic scattering? Policy people on please. It's B. Okay. What's a, well, remember, this, this is important, it's going to be on the exam. What's the definition of a Q value? Something minus something. A plus B minus C minus D. Yes. Now, in this case, what's A and B and what's C and D? Which means? Q value is zero. Zero. Q, Q value is zero. I can also have a case where A plus B come together, and you have an inelastic reaction, a little bit like a silly putty or something, where you permanently change one of the products. I can excite carbon, for example, to its first excited state. This takes 4 MeV to push carbon up to its first excited state. That's called inelastic scattering. What's the, what's the Q value for that? Is it zero, positive, or negative? It's the product that you see there for the forward point B and B, or, or the sum. The sum yeah. So which is heavier, right-hand side or left-hand side? By Einstein. Yeah, because I put energy into the, the carbon nucleus is now heavier because I've excited it. It's, there's more energy in the carbon nucleus. It's heavier. Therefore, the Q value for this is? Um, 4.43 MeV. Which sign? Uh, it's the sign of the carbon nucleus. This is a reaction that takes energy to happen, right? So the right-hand side is heavier than the left-hand side. Therefore, the mass of A and B minus the mass of C and E is a negative number. That's a reaction that takes energy to happen. It's what you would call in ordinary chemistry an endothermic reaction. Now, there are a few rules, not many. Um, you always must conserve charge. You can't have a reaction where you have you know, plus 3 on the right-hand side and uh, plus 5 on the left-hand side. Charge must be conserved. Total nucleon number must be conserved as well. So uh, here you have a neutron, uh, 1 plus 12 is 13. Protons and neutrons are collectively called um, uh, nucleons. And you have to conserve energy. Other than that, pretty much do what you want. <clears throat> there are some other things, but not of consequence to you. OK, here's the interesting question. And I think this was, uh, I think, uh, Professor Knopf in his history sort of alluded to this. Fission was like falling off a log. It was discovered in, in December of 38 um, by, uh, it was uh, done on this side of the Atlantic uh, literally a month later. Um, in 1942, Fermi had built his first uh, reactor called CP1, the Chicago Pile 1, under in the squash court under the uh, Alonzo Stagg uh, 
football stadium. Um, three years later, after a, this immense crash program, we actually had uh, nuclear weapons. Um, along the way, we built some small reactors, but by 51, we had our first modest uh, reactors producing um, uh, elect electricity put on the grid. I think Ames, Iowa, 100 kilowatt. Um, and now in today's world, we have close to 20% of the electricity in the world being produced by fission reactors. It was easy, couldn't fail. Here, 1946, there's a patent, the uh, uh, Thompson Blackman patent by, in the United Kingdom that patented this reaction that even looked better. You know, fewer objectionable waste products, uh, more energy per nucleon, should go like gangbusters. What's the problem? Um, 1955, Project Sherwood announced by executive order, uh, President Eisenhower. Um, when are we going to get break even out of a fusion device, either a plasma a magnetic fusion device or a laser uh, uh, driven fusion? Optimistically, well, for ITER, this huge project being built up in France, by the time they're finished, I shudder to think it'll probably be $30 billion. Um, probably 2032 is the earliest. Break even means what? What's the, the, the connotation you get out of break even? It's becoming economical in a sense. Yeah, actually, there's several ways of determining break even. Um, generously, if you look at NIF, they're going to talk about, well, how much optical light goes in versus how much fusion power goes out. But then, of course, that sweeps under the rug the fact that going between the wall plug and creating the, the flash lamps, which pump the, the laser amplifiers and all that, there's inefficiencies. So people will then sometimes talk about uh, uh, engineering right here, which is wall plug to out. And then to be economically viable, you want to be the gain to be approximately 10. But the general idea is break even is the same amount of energy coming out as you've got coming in, like that. Um, so that will have been 90 years just to get a demonstration of break even. Power on the grid, optimistically, um, your lifetime. I will be 100 years old in the year 2050. I hope to see it. Probably won't. Uh, so, simple question. Why was this dead easy? And that relates to something we're going to talk about today, and that was just uh, abysmally hard. And I think we talked about this about five minutes ago. <clears throat> what's, the, what's the difference between those two reactions? This one, by the way, is giving you more back to the buck. There's more energy coming out. That's more exothermic per nucleon than this one. But this one was dead simple. This one was just very, very difficult to make work. Uh, yes. In this, in the first case, a, a neutron of arbitrarily low energy. There's nothing to prevent it from drifting into uranium nucleus and then splitting the thing apart. In the second case, that is a charged particle reaction. On a very dry day, if you ever, um, uh, you know, have, you know, take things like uh, out of the uh, out of the dryer. Uh, you know, you might take two shirts or handkerchiefs, they're both positively charged and they repel one another, or two pitfalls. Light charged things take a lot of energy to get them close to one another. And remember, <coughs> the nuclear force is very short ranged. If you don't get those nuclei to come up and kiss like that, you're not going to get a nuclear reaction. It's not a lot of energy, it's maybe about 100 kilovolts of energy, but unless the average temperature of a plasma is such that these things are going around with 100 kilovolts temperature, you're not going to have much of a rate for these ions to collide and make a reaction. Once the reaction goes, of course, it emits a lot of energy, but you've got to surmount this 
what you call in chemistry uh, an activation barrier. Here we call it a Coulomb barrier. That's the, that's the deal. Particles require a certain minimum kinetic energy before there's any appreciable reaction rate. Um, you can make a very simple formula for what that is. Neutrons have no charge and can induce reaction with essentially zero kinetic energy. Interestingly, as we'll see shortly, um, thermal neutrons, in fact, what's called the cross section, is on, in general higher for slow neutrons than fast neutrons. That's a, a sort of a general principle. Hang in there, as I say, this is the last sort of, sort of technical, foundational, fundamental thing. Everything else from here on up, we're going to start talking about technology and applications. This was Chadwick's reaction he used to discover the neutron, um, a helium-4 nucleus, an alpha, that came out of a radioactive nuclei, 5 MeV or so, hitting a target. In this case, it was a thin sheet of beryllium a thin slab of beryllium, giving rise to a carbon and a neutron. Um, usually you will see this written in the following way. You have the target and then a parenthesis, beam, comma, ejectile, and then the residual like that. Um, you could say, well, Maybe some reactions are going on and I'm not observing anything. Which should I put in the parenthesis? Usually the lighter thing here, uh, either it's observed, one of these things is observed in an experiment or the lighter thing, and then the heavier thing is normally put out here. But this thing is synonymous with that. A plus B goes to C plus D. Alpha uh, shot onto beryllium 9, out comes the neutron leaving behind the carbon 12. OK. One thing uh, that we are going to you, you'll uh, going to learn here, uh, and we will have you do some problems later on. Maybe not necessarily in the next problem set, but if not in this problem set, the next one, we're going to have to talk about the notion of a cross section. Um, it is a way of parameterizing um, the uh, or giving you the fundamental data you need to understand reaction rates. So let me start off with the following problem. I want you to determine the size of a bowling ball. You've never seen a bowling ball in your life. <clears throat> and the way, uh, and, and this is kind of a game or a puzzle. I've actually taken a huge bale of hay maybe 10 meters by 10 meters by 5 meters deep, something like this. And in the, the bale of hay, I've embedded a series of bowling balls, like raisins in a, uh, in, a, in a cake, OK? And I ask you, tell me the size of a bowling ball. And um, I give you a shotgun. And it turns out. With a shotgun, you can determine the size of the bowling ball. And the way to do it is the following. And this is exactly what we do. We've been doing for 80 years and what Professor Lee Bernstein uh, does for uh, a living is you go to accelerators, you make a beam, you shoot the beam through a very, very thin foil, and then you look at the products that get scattered. Or alternatively, you look what what comes out minus what goes in. And what happens here is I, I now stand back in the bale of hay. I fire the shotgun. And let's say there's 100 pellets that come out of the shotgun. And out the back end of this bale of hay comes 95. Five of them have encountered a bowling ball and have scattered. Now, this is a very simple reaction. This is what we call elastic scattering. BB in on a bowling ball, BB out plus a bowling ball. Okay, elastic scattering uh, reaction like that. I contend <clears throat> that if you know the number of bowling balls in the bale of hay, you can calculate um, the size of uh, that of that um, of those bowling balls um, by comparing the number of BBs that make it through the bale of hay versus 
um, between these incidents for shotgun pellets on the front of the bale keg. So let's go back to that picture. If I shoot a BB through the bale of hay, what's the probability that it hits a bowling ball? What do you need to know? Suppose this is, for example, 10 meters, and that's 10 meters like that. Okay, what two things tell you the probability of hitting bowling ball? What two things that you need to know? You gotta know the area of that circle is going out the way of the Yeah, that's exactly it. It's the relative, and this is where the, the term came from originally, why they call it a cross section. Although the physics behind real nuclear processes is more complicated. The probability of a scattering is a ratio. And the ratio is the number of bowling balls there, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 23, 23 bowling balls <clears throat> times the area of the bowling ball divided by <clears throat> the area of the overall square, okay? Or put differently, it's just the fraction of the area occluded by the bowling balls. That's all there is to it. And when you're doing an experiment, you're determining the area of the ball by shooting a large number of pellets in, in, and out. If there's a very small difference, that means the probability of scattering was very small, and you went and worked backwards to calculate the area. If it was proportionally larger, it was larger. Okay. That's basically the idea. Okay. When you do it, a well-designed designed experiment, you there is a hidden assumption that the target is not so thick that you have bowling balls one in front of another that would kind of screw up the mathematics, but that's almost always the case. Nuclei are so small that the probability of taking a particle out of the beam is in fact quite uh, small for a, a, a thin target we typically use. So here is the definition of the cross-section um, <clears throat> like that. Um, this is synonymous with what you just saw before. I take the density, the number per cubic centimeter in matter, if I put up a slab of carbon or a slab of lead as a target of the cyclotron, I multiply by the thickness of that, and now I have the number per square centimeter. That's as you saw before. <clears throat> If you idealize this, and then you have that in that row, in that bracketed there, is the number per square centimeter that is presented to a particle traversing um, your target. Then you have what is the effective effectively is what's termed a cross-section of, uh, of um, in units of centimeters squared. That gives you a, um, uh, a, a pure number, which is the probability that a single bullet going through the target, a proton out of a cyclotron, or a BB going through a bale of hay, is going to scatter. <clears throat> Then the number that scatter, i.e. the ones that are removed from the beam, is the number in times that probability. That's the basis for the experiments. Some of you actually collaborate with people like Lee Bernstein or Bethany Goldblum or other people. You may have taken 
apart in experiments with us down at the neutron generator in the basement of Echeverry. That's the tool of our trade by which we measure the physical quantity which encapsulates or encodes the um, how readily certain reactions take place. Now, in the early days, the heady days of nuclear physics in the 1930s, they came up with an interesting unit for a uh, cross-section. It's called a barn. As in, in the early days, it said, gee, that was a, that reaction goes like a gangbuster. It must have a cross-section the, the size of a barn, the size of a barn door, okay? Why is that a convenient or a natural scale for uh, a unit? Think back on something you learned early on. What's the typical size of uh, an atomic nucleus? See if you can remember. Okay, one of our policy people here. It's even okay to look at your notes. Typical size of a nucleus <clears throat> in radius. This would be a very fair exam question. Very roughly, then factor of 10. What's that typical size of a dimension of the nucleus? A non policy person. Yes. Now, remind us what is a, a farad. So it's typically one to ten farads. What's a farad? In scientific notation, ten to the ten to the minus fifteen meters, or ten to the minus thirteen centimeters. So let's take a big nucleus that might have a radius of ten farads. Forgetting constants of pi, <clears throat> that's now 10 to the minus 12 centimeters. And therefore, the area of that is that square. So the, the, basically, the geometrical cross-section is going to be on the order of 10 to the minus 12 centimeters square. Forget the fact that it's circular rather than square, and I've forgotten the fact of pi. That's 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters. And that's why it was very convenient to call this, to make that as our standard thumb or a standard inch. OK, so this is what's called a barn because that is, a pro that is a good representation for the, the geometrical cross-section of an average nucleus, 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters. Now, what's interesting is, and this is where you don't, you uh, happily don't need to get into a lot of quantum mechanics and nuclear physics. Um, you might say, well, if I shoot in a, a proton at an atomic nucleus, um, isn't it just like hitting a pipe plate? Isn't the cross section always just the geometrical area? And the answer is no. It can be very much smaller. It can be very much bigger. Uh, for very slow particles, very slow neutrons coming in, in fact, the cross section can be thousands of times bigger than that. You say, my God, that sounds crazy. You are absolved from taking quantum mechanics. You can celebrate. So you, you, you just have to use the numbers. You don't need to actually understand them as my students in any 201 or Lee students in 101 have to, have to do that. You just have to use the numbers. You don't have to say, why is that cross-section bigger? Why is it small? So now let's take a look. If I ask the question, what is the cross-section if I shoot in a neutron, <clears throat> either fast or slow, um, and causing a fission of a fissionable nucleus, it's very interesting. So let's take a look at, for example, Neptunium-237. It's actually a uh, 
plausible uh, weapons grade material. So here you have three colors. Um, you have fast neutrons, i.e. in the MEV range. And you shoot in a fast neutron. The cross section to, for that neutron to cause a free shooting event right there, the cross section is a little bit over a bar. It seems to be about two bars. So it's kind of geometrical. The neutron hits the nucleus, bang, it fizzes. Fizzes. You have thermalized and what they call well thermalized. Don't worry too much about the the, 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 the difference between them. But here you can see the cross section can be on the order of 100 bars. Here's Americium 242. The fast neutron cross section for causing a fission is under a bar. Slow neutrons have a fission cross section of more than 1,000 bars. If you're building a bomb or you're building a reactor, you like things to have a large cross section. You're going to get a high rate out of it. Now, here's a trick I'm not including in my lecture, but we'll, I'll, I'll allude to it a little bit here, and Mr. Presti will talk about it next time, which, is, which has to do with called thermalization of neutrons. Clearly, there's more profit to be made in, uh, uh, with slow neutrons because the cross-section is like a factor of a thousand higher for slow neutrons than fast neutrons. Very interesting physics behind that. On the other hand, what's the average energy when, when a, a nucleus fissions and all of a sudden three neutrons, two, three, four neutrons appear? What is the typical energy of those neutrons? Are they fast or slow? Fast. Right. They come out with MEV, few MEV energy. So here's the question. Um, gee, I've got fast neutrons. I'd like slow neutrons. What do you do about that? How would you turn a fast neutron into a slow neutron? Moderator. Yeah. What's a good moderator? Water. Yeah. Why is water good? Light. Yes. Here's the thing. <clears throat> if I have a um, a bowling ball, or a perfect steel sphere, and I shoot in a steel marble. It comes in with a certain velocity, 10 meters a second. What's the end state? It goes back out with 10 meters a second. Very little energy is taken up by the bowling ball, and the, the, the energy, the speed coming in is the same as the speed coming out. On the other hand, this is the, the little toy that you uh, You've seen these things, these uh, <coughs> these things you see. <coughs> you know, where you take one of these marbles and you swing it <coughs> and it hits another one like this. So if I have a two things of equal mass come in, so these two masses are equal. Suppose they hit dead on. This one's coming at a velocity, this is A and this is B. And then velocity B initially is zero. <clears throat> what happens here afterwards? Dead on. Think of who, how many people here play pool? <clears throat> Equal masses. There's a pool player. Pool shark. You don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Thank you for warning me. Okay. Go like that. Exactly. The first one comes to a complete rest. And the second one goes off taking uh, the same velocity as the incoming one. So V prime is V sub A initial, and V A prime is zero. Equal mass things is the best way to slow things down. Now, on the average, as you know, when you play billiards, you don't always hit things dead on. You may graze it, in which case the initial projectile has most of the energy, this has a little bit. If you hit it dead on, this one has zero, and this takes it all. On the average, as a rule of thumb, 
If I have a neutron, which has the same mass as a proton, I have any hydrogenous material. Water has a lot of hydrogen in it. Um, paraffin, any, any hydrocarbon has oodles and oodles and oodles of hydrogen in there. That's the best thing to moderate it. On the average, you're going to lose half of the energy per collision. A very simple problem, and I'm going to give it to you on the homework, is how many collisions does it take to go from an MEV energy down to a thermal energy? And you'll do that, and it's, it's very simple. That's what happens. This is why. This is one of the two reasons you have water in a typical reactor. One of them is cooling. The other is to take very quickly a fast neutron down to a slow neutron. So now you capitalize on the fact that, that the actinide will soak up that neutron like kitty litter, and bang, it will fission. That's a very effective way of, uh, of, 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 of fissioning. Okay. Ah, thought about it. It did it again. I had uh, a bar chart here. Typical thermal new cross sections here. Um, and you can see they go from um, uh, absorption or scattering for a helium nucleus for a neutron from 3V0 to xenon-135. The cross section is almost three, three, three million bars. What's the physics? Eh, you don't have to worry about that. My students have to worry about that, but not you. You just have to use it. Let me just finish. We'll show one very cool thing here. <coughs> Cadmium is one of these nuclei that have a very, very, very high capture cross section. And so here's one of these uh, very interesting things that you can see on YouTube. These pieces of plastic surround a slow neutron detector uh, that consists of helium-3 gas in a proportional tube. And this electronics over here is uh, counting the uh, uh, response of that tube to neutrons. Here we see the uh, meter is showing about 50 neutrons per second or about halfway up the scale. As I've noted in the uh, previous video, uh, the neutron source we use here is a fast neutron source uh, comprised of americium in close contact with beryllium. And it releases neutrons with a mean energy of about 4 MeV. Uh, on contrast, or with, uh, in contrast to that, the uh, detector tube mostly detects slow neutrons that have been moderated in the plastic and reflected back into the tube. The plastic has got lots of hydrogen. This is a model. Now we're going to place a piece of cadmium, which is a very strong absorber of slow neutrons around the proportional counter. And we will see how that impacts the count rate. So first I'll take this piece of plastic out. There's your neutron source. And then I will temporarily remove the fast neutron source which the tape will allow me. And we'll place the cadmium sleeve onto the tube. And it will replace the neutron source. And the piece of plastic. Now let's take a look at our count rate. It's taken a serious hit from the cadmium attenuation. It used to be up there halfway up the scale at 50 per second. Now it's barely at 10 per second. So more than three quarters of our uh, neutron flux, uh, our low energy neutron flux that had been making it into the tube is now being eaten up by the cadmium. Let's try a somewhat different experiment. I'm going to take the cadmium sleeve off the tube. And in this experiment, I'm going to place 
the neutron source into a cadmium sleeve. Like that. Now I'll place the cadmium covered source onto the tube and I'll replace the piece of plastic. Now we'll do a little quiz. <clears throat> if I put the cadmium around the detector of slow neutrons, the neutrons got moderated and ate them up when the cross section went down. What's going to happen now? Now that I've placed the cadmium around the source, is the situation going to be more like the initial condition, the second condition, or something different? How many people say you'll see a lot of neutrons? How many people see, will say you see few neutrons? Even the NE students can vote here. Anybody? Wasn't there a third option? Uh, let's take the vote. Anybody take a guess? You, can, you have a 50% chance of being right. Let's see a lot. Good. Why? Um, you've essentially created a fast neutron source. Right. And then those neutrons will be moderated. Yes. So the point is the neutrons, um, cadmium is not particularly effective at stopping fast neutrons. So the neutrons go straight on out, then they moderate, they become slow, and then the, your helium 3 neutron uh, detector is, is unprotected, and you'll see essentially as you did in the first case. By the way, I'll make an introduction in just a second. Whoops, sorry. Where did this thing go? Hi, I'm Here we are. These pieces of plastic surround a slow new. Now I'll place the cadmium covered source onto the tube and I'll replace the piece of plastic. And we will see what this has done to our neutron count rate. We reach the halfway the original scale, condition. almost uh, 50 counts per second uh, before beginning this experiment. Now uh, we're almost uh, at 40 counts per second, or almost uh, only one fifth of where we were when uh, we had no cadmium whatsoever in here. So, in contrast to the previous experiment, where the cadmium sleeve covered the tube and attenuated uh, four-fifths of our neutron flux getting into the tube. Now we are uh, putting the cadmium around the fast neutron source and the neutrons uh, at the high energies have no trouble getting through the cadmium. They are being moderated and reflected back into the detector by the surrounding plastic. Okay, enough of that. I'll show one more view graph and uh, I think we will basically be done. So what's going on? That's what's going on. The absorption cross-section for fast neutrons, 10 to the 6 dB as an as a NEB, is less than 10 barns here. But if I slow the neutrons down to thermal energies, it's like 10,000. It's a factor of 10,000 more efficacy for cadmium to absorb slow neutrons than fast neutrons. So, by putting the cadmium sleeve around the source, the fast source, you just it's a waste of energy. It's just a waste of time because the neutron goes through there. It doesn't do anything. Then it, it, it moderates and it'll be captured by the, the helium, uh, the uh, helium three proportional to. Here I show fission cross sections going from very fast to 10 MeV all the way down to uh, a micro EV energy. Here's your thermal. Um, here's the thing, uranium has no fission probability whatsoever, appreciable below, uh, uh, below about an MeV. Plutonium 239 and 235 have very significant sort of 10 bar and cross sections here in the, in the thermal range. One of the things I'm gonna have you do, just to make it fun for you, um, 
just like I had to do a measurement of the exponential decay law using beer foam, you can also measure the size of, for example, a quarter or a, uh, a lid to a Maxwell House coffee can or any kind of object like this by going into a floor, into a, a room that has a linoleum floor with parallel lines, and then doing an experiment by which you throw the thing up in the air 100 times, and then count how many times does it land on a crack versus land in between the cracks. And by doing the statistics on that, you can actually measure experimentally the diameter of a circular object. And that's one of the things I'm going to have you do uh, for uh, your homework. It's not as fun as beer, but it uh, keeps things real. Last thing here, what happens to the neutron? We say, well, it got taken out of play. How did it get taken out of play? Lots of things can happen. It could have elastically scattered. It could have inelastically scattered. It could have been captured or it could have caused fission or other things. So one can break down the total cross-section into subcategories of what happened to the neutron. And with that, we're finished. I want to introduce one of our most famous alumni, Dr. Patricia Schuster, uh, who is now a uh, the presidential postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan. Next year, somewhere, she will be a faculty uh, member at a prestigious research university. And she was a graduate of this class. And uh, you want to give us any comments or observations on 285? I'm just so happy to see so many people here. Um, I was in the class the first year I was taught, and then was involved over the years, and it's sort of you know, population has gone up and down. Uh, so it's really encouraging to see so many people in the room. You were a GSI, weren't you? I was, yeah. Which year? The second year. Wonderful. Okay, thank you for coming by. Can mm -hmm. you say a few words about what you're doing with your postdoc? Okay, um, I have a, so I was the president of postdoctoral fellowship at Michigan, um, which is sort of like a free, a free assistant professor position where I can build my own research portfolio. And so I'm working on the material science of organic simulator detectors. And also I'm working on some uh, neutron imaging techniques for arms control verification. So trying to keep policy oriented projects in my, in my portfolio. Uh, yeah, a whole variety of things. Great, thank you for joining us again. And the questions. Yeah. I'm, this, this is probably the most challenging of the lectures you've had, but the notion of a cross section is really important for understanding how reactors work, how bombs work, and so forth. And as I say, this is the last of sort of the foundational stuff. The rest here is going to be fun. So if you made it through here, you learned to do some problems, you're golden. Okay. Take a break.